All right, so this is going to be a little bit of a different perspective, um, you know, similar to what uh, Dr. Ellsberg just talked about, but uh, a very different kind of take on some of it, and a much more kind of general, less very specific case study kind of to Nicaragua. Um, so I'm going to start off with intersectionality and why it's important for adolescents and why it's important in global health and at that intersection of its own. So intersectionality, really a lot of people kind of trace it back to Sojourner Truth and her Ain't I a Woman speech in 1851 and sort of the conceptual kind of original underpinnings. And in that speech, she actually said, talked about how being a woman is a social construct. And in her situation, it was a social construct that was really reserved for white women. She says, the man over there says that the women need to be helped into carriages, lifted over ditches, and have the best places everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles. It gives me any best place, and ain't I a woman? And I cut some of this out for brevity, um, but she also goes on to talk about um, that she could work as hard as a man, eat as much as a man, bear the lash as well, um, and that it's not necessarily this very dichotomous kind of thing, but it is this social construct that depends very much on where you are, at what period in time, as well as your own personal um, traits, right, that, that affect these kinds of constructs. So Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a law professor, which is important, coined the term intersectionality, and that was in 1989. And I know some people think it's a very new term. It's not. It's been around for quite a while. Her, her term, use of that term, was specifically talking about how black women are treated in the US justice system. Again, law professor, right? And it drew on many, many years of black feminist theory and concepts um, to get to this point. And the kind of crux of the idea is that if you're a black woman in the US justice system, you're probably not gonna be treated fairly. And we don't really know if you're gonna be not treated fairly because you're black or because you're a woman or because of some kind of you know, confluence of both of those things. And when we put everybody into silos all the time, it's very hard to get at what's actually going on in some incomplex um, social processes, right? So hence the term intersectionality and kind of thinking about nobody has one identity, nobody is in this sort of static um, environment without any pressure. Um, and so the idea that we do, we always kind of look at things that way probably doesn't work for most people, right? So this is a much more recent, so a 2014, kind of where we're at with intersectionality now definition. Um, and this is a fantastic uh, paper, if anyone. It's Intersectionality 101. If anyone's really interested in this and wants to dig into it, and I know some of the students in the room have read it. But the idea that um, intersectionality is uh, human beings have different social locations, social locations being race, class, ethnicity, disability, age, you can make a huge list, right? Um, we interact in the context of connected systems and structures of power, and those go from governments and laws and policies down to the institutions that we're in every day, including Stanford and other kinds of institutions, right? And then through all of this, you get interdependent forms of privilege and oppression. These are shaped by colonialism, racism, homophobia, um, et cetera. So, and I really want to kind of underline this interdependent forms of privilege and oppression because I think we also have a tendency to only think about oppression and to only think about the negative and some of the real opportunities for kind of intervening and thinking about how we can make things better come around thinking about strengths. And you know, Dr. Ellsberg just talked about this in terms of the strengths of the women's movement and how many changes they were able to make in the last 30 years. If we focus on how the women are being oppressed rather than what their strengths are, sometimes we don't see the opportunities quite as much. So that's something you know, really is important to think about. And something else about that is that um, almost all of us, and certainly probably everybody in this room, has privileges. Right, just being able to take the time out of our schedule today to be at a place like this, to be in this forum, we're all fairly privileged. Um, and many of us have had a lot of oppressions and you know, very challenging times getting here, right? And for each person in this room, that's different. So that these are inter interlocking things that are very kind of complex social phenomenon. So why is this important? Ah, so this is the same basic idea. So rarely the result of a single factor. 
intersections and complicated kind of situations. And so why do, this is, all, most of you are nodding, right? I mean, you're in the session to start with, so you're a biased group, but you're nodding, you're thinking, yeah, of course, duh, right, for the most part. So, but why don't we do this? Kind of all the time and everything, right? And it's because it's hard, right? Humans like to put things in boxes. We like to categorize things. We like to be able to say um, it's A or it's B. And then also when we make a law or a policy or even, you know, certain decisions about who gets healthcare dollars, for example, right? We do need cutoffs. We do need categories. So we're really sort of intent on categorizing things. And when we have these overlapping categories, it becomes very complicated and difficult to measure, right? And to say what's what. So I think that's the biggest challenge. Um, there's also this historic fact that most of research, the vast majority of research in the world is done on men and on adults. Even when women are included, it's almost all adults. So in terms of having any research on adolescents or children, and there's a few pediatricians in the room, um, there's very, very little, incredibly little, and also most of the research done is done in high income settings. And Dr. Ellsberg talked about this as well, right? We know very little about low income settings and that's getting better, um, but it's getting better slowly. So it's a very specific population. Um, and data science is sort of starting to tackle this, right? And is starting to think about how we manage complex data. Um, but right now, a lot of what it is is sort of these complex interaction terms, which most of you in the audience know are very difficult to interpret. Um, multiple stratifications, but then you've got categories. There's just a lot of them. Um, so there are some new methods. And I put at least one reference here, um, but we can I could talk more about kind of where the methods are going. But there are some newer methods to kind of manage this kind of complexity in data. And also, this is just, you don't need to read this. This is just a framework for how to include intersectionality in research, a published framework, and just from a couple years ago. So again, people are thinking about this. There are increasingly frameworks and ways to kind of include this in your own work and kind of ideas of how you're approaching things. So why intersectionality in global adolescent health? So this is a photo that um, a group of us were in on a research trip to the informal settlements in Nairobi. And this is a photo we took. Um, and I want you to look at, you can look a little bit at the setting in general, right? So no sanitation, um, but I want you to focus on this young woman back here, and she's probably about 20 years old, and I want you to kind of think about what her life looks like and how that shapes her health and well-being kinds of outcomes. And I zoomed in here, the quality's not great because this was taken with an iPhone 6. This is not one they'll put on a billboard anytime soon. But, um, <laughs> but um, again, just a little bit about she has, right, it looks like multiple children here, an infant on her back and a toddler here. Possibly they're not hers, but probably they are. Um, she's getting water from a water point here, which she's paying for the water and the quality still may be dubious. She's living in this poverty stricken environment, lots of trash, um, you know, lots of the houses are all made of kind of found materials. So if you think about kind of what her prospects for the future are and what goes into her health and well being, Right, there's so many different things and untangling those all are challenging. So you guys may be able to think of more than what's up here, but I, you know, my immediate things were poverty, um, class, tribe possibly in Kenya is important. Um, her gender clearly is important. The young men have very different things that they're doing at this point in life than a young woman does, especially one who's a mother. Um, so age and motherhood. Geography, the fact that she is in this informal settlement, her life would be very different if she were in a rural area. You know, that Dr. Ellsberg talked a little bit about that as well. Not necessarily better or worse, but very different. Um, in Kenya, the government doesn't have any sort of agreement to provide water or sanitation to its citizens. Um, that's not true in every country, but in general, that's, that's the case that there's no, in, in this country, it's also true. There's no commitment to clean water. Um, there's no land tenure or stable housing. There's a lot of colonial, neo-colonial challenges to this day in Kenya. And so without taking all of that into account, right, it's very difficult to think about how to improve this young woman's health and well-being. If we do any one of these things, which is a more traditional funding model, we're probably not going to have much of an effect, right, because you've got all these other things going on. So I just have a quick slide on kind of what does this leave her at risk of, and I think the bottom line is everything, so it's not super interesting, but early childbearing, 
school dropout, you don't have to leave school in Kenya if you're pregnant, but most do and don't come back. A lot of countries, you're still required to leave school and you're not allowed to go back at all. So that's the end no matter what. Um, Non-communicable diseases, poor diet, no exercise, all of those issues that lead to lots of problems down the line. Um, physical, sexual, economic, emotional violence of all sorts. And these rates are very high in these settings of violence. Um, and very limited economic opportunity and sort of ability potentially to break out of, out of this cycle. So I would argue that, so intersectionality and thinking about the big picture is really important in global health in general. It's even more important for adolescents, right? Because adolescents are still figuring out who they want to be, what their identities look like. They may know what some of them are, but they may be thinking about other ones still. And they change very quickly, right? You're moving from childhood into being a teenager into having the roles and responsibilities of an adult in a fairly short period of time, both in terms of the social pressures outside of you as well as your own developmental, like your own development, both cognitive and physical development. It's a period of huge change. So you're going through a lot of different changes, right? So again, when we're doing research on this age group, really thinking about where they're at and where they're at today may not be where they're at in a month or two if we're doing a long-term study or a long-term intervention. Kind of taking into account how things change over time becomes particularly important in this age group. Something that's really hot here at Stanford now, which many of you know, is the life course perspective. And thinking about how what happens to you in childhood and adolescence, sort of before the age of 20 or so, often is sort of to blame for diseases much further down the line, sometimes even 40, 60 years later. You're setting yourself up in a lot of ways in childhood um, for everything that happens later. And those of us in pediatrics love this because it gives some credence to pediatrics being really important. Um, but it, re it really is true if you think about it. And if you think about our young woman in the picture again, the fact that she's already a mother, that she's probably out of school, um, all of these things, right, severely limit her abilities in the future. Not abilities, her likelihood of success in the future. And then, of course, there's just straight up physical you know, issues as a result of something like violence, um, whether it's, you know, the directly lead to column, death, unplanned pregnancy, injury is fairly obvious. The middle column, many of you may know, those who, who have been a victim of violence are more likely to both perpetrate violence and be a victim again in the future. They're much more likely to use substances. Um, they're much more likely to uh, abuse their own children, all of these kinds of things. And then this column, I think, is maybe one that's most interesting. And this, all of this data comes from high-income countries, so it's not necessarily true in low-income, although I think we can guess that it probably is. Um, obesity, heart disease, smoking, physical inactivity, these are all related to having a history of violence. Um, and I think we could hypothesize why. We won't go into it. But all of these diseases, again, that life course perspective, right, that we think of, in many cases, it is also childhood violence as well. If you look at violence, and Dr. Ellsberg mentioned this, it, it often starts quite young um, and then goes across the lifespan. Okay, so promising practices for violence reduction. And this is really brief because we don't have a ton of time. And this is a very tiny snapshot of what's out there. So I don't want to suggest in any way that, that th these are all of them. Um, and there's also been really a a very large body of literature just in the last few years on this. Um, so I think it's, it's really an exciting time to be thinking about this. Uh, so so this, is, um, this is Mary Ellsberg's, the lead author on this article. And this is the, she mentioned the Lancet in 2014, put out kind of a review of all of the, the good literature in, on violence um, in a variety of settings, not sort of just one setting. This is just one article. Um, and what, what the best practices were. So for those of you that are interested in violence, this is a great, still a great place to start kind of learning about this field. So the most important takeaways related to the talk today, and in some ways for me overall, thinking about this, is that the evidence for interventions is highly skewed, not only towards high income countries, which I already mentioned, but towards response rather than prevention. And this is not unusual in the US, right? We spend a lot more of our healthcare dollars on responding than we do on prevention, but it's even a bit more skewed in the world of violence. Um, and this partially is because of all the things Dr. Ellsberg brought up, right? Everything from sort of family thing, we don't talk about it, violence isn't a big deal, what are you worried about? This is just what your life's gonna be like. Um, 
to just people not wanting to admit that it exists at all, uh, and also some people not necessarily understanding the kind of breadth of health consequences related to violence. So this to me is the most interesting part and brings us back as well to this need for this intersectional approach and having this concept of intersectionality. The successful programs engage multiple stakeholders with multiple approaches, right? They aim to address underlying risk factors, including social norms and, uh, that condone violence and gender inequality, and the support of the development of nonviolent behaviors. So the sort of siloed one size, not one size fits all, but si these siloed approaches that don't think about intersectionality, that don't think about complexity, that don't think about the big picture, are not the ones that are showing success. And we have a lot of programs that are showing success now, but they are not the sort of one thing kinds of programs that a lot of times do end up getting funded, especially in biomedical research. The other thing about this, and of course this is five years old now, is while we have some really nice promising interventions, there's a lot where there just isn't any evidence. And there's also a fair amount that are, fair amount that are pretty clearly ineffective, many of which are still getting quite a bit of use and interest today. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, and this is to echo Dr. Ellsberg again, there's a lot of political kind of machinations that go into violence programs, much more so than a lot of other kinds of health-related interventions. So just some really new evidence that I think is exciting and I hope you, you all will think is exciting as well. So school-based programs are very popular for young people um, because the children are in school anyway. Right, so it's an opportunity for a captive population to be able to provide um, an intervention in that setting. And there is some evidence that this is a program in particular that was just studied as part of the Wet Works program in Pakistan. Um, and they actually did a facilitated play, play sessions between boys and girls that had gender norms changing um, messages specifically built into those play sections, for example. They have a session where half the class gets a red balloon, half the class gets a yellow balloon. If you have a red balloon, you have to keep your balloon up in the air for a minute and the people around you help you keep it up in the air. If you have a yellow balloon, you have to keep your balloon up in the air for a minute and you're not allowed to stand up and nobody else helps you. Or another way they play it is the other people actually try to get your balloon out of the air while you're trying to keep your balloon up. And they talk about how that's the difference between being a boy and being a girl in this society that one is always sort of being raised up and supported and the other one is either being not supported or sometimes actively even torn down, right? So play opportunities that are fun but also have gender norms components. And this is throwing some nice results. Um, they couldn't look at sort of sexual violence related questions in Pakistan, but they were able to look at peer violence and corporal punishment and saw some really significant results in both of those decreasing. So a fun, promising intervention. And this actually, the children were as young as, as 10 or 11, so in quite young children. So training groups for women or girls, um, and you know, older, young, young women and girls. Um, we've been involved in an empowerment self-defense intervention. There is quite a good evidence from the US primarily at this point in time that empowerment self-defense training can reduce sexual assault, specifically actually measuring that amongst university students. Um, there's some evidence that may be among high school students as well. So this is definitely an area that's still being tested. This is an area where there's a lot of programming going on, most of which is not getting evaluated. Um, but we're gonna be replicating some of that work actually here on campus. And some of the work is also, a very similar program is also being replicated now in um, East Swatini, which used to be Swaziland. So we'll see you know, in two very different settings if, if some of these programs are replicable. So training for men and boys is a big area of interest. And there's also training for couples. And I'm not gonna talk about this so much because in the age group we're talking about, there's less of that. That tends to start more around 18. Um, but there's plenty of 15 and 16, 16 year olds who are married. Um, but training for men and boys um, has been tricky and challenging. But there are some, there is some suggestion that um, particularly gender norms, transformation kinds of approaches where they're looking at, at inequalities can at least decrease reports of using um, physical or sexual violence in their relationships. So some, some promising things there. There's promising things in some of the couples work too in, um, in older, slightly, just slightly older populations. Um, and notice this is a general population of men, not ones that necessarily have a history of violence specifically. 
So I'm almost, yeah, I'm out of time. So in summary, um, I think intersectionality is just a really nice sort of lens for us to borrow in global health and especially global health related to adolescence where things are complex and it really I think can help us understand adolescence through time. Um, it really, you know, they encourage us to think about complex social positions and interactions between power and social systems, um, especially during this time when things are changing so fast. And then I also want you all to think about this last point. Intersectionality in the way it's used today um, really has a social justice mission. It did from the beginning when Kimberly Crenshaw sort of coined the term. But that's another thing that I don't want people to lose. It's, and, and it really reflects, too, on what Dr. Ellsberg talked about. It's not just about sort of the academic piece of it. It has a social justice mission it, fundamentally kind of engaged in it where you're building coalitions between different people, right? It recognizes that nobody can do this kind of independently in their own silo because it is large and complex. And you're doing that with different um, groups and then working towards social justice as a group. And as a last thing, I just want to say that in, in anything with adolescence, um, and this includes adolescents in low and middle income countries, one of the things we struggle with but that's so important is to include their voices in the interventions and in the research processes so that we get the kind of results that we um, really can believe in and think are, are true and have them included in what's going on. Also, adolescents don't engage very well in interventions that they didn't have a say in, and those of you who are parents know that. Um, so, so really essential. <laughs>